Great. And I think folks have been joining the meeting now, which is great. Um, I just want to make sure everything is working from a screen sharing perspective. We've had this in the past. Great. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll give folks just another 30 seconds to get uh, situated. We're really excited to be having Beth Osborne join us today uh, from Transportation from America. Um, she's just an amazing advocate uh, for sustainable transportation. So um, yeah, we'll just give everyone a, a, a moment to get settled um, and then get on the road. Uh, and just as a reminder, this is part of a monthly webinar series that a thousand friends is hosting on sustainable communities. Uh, you know, so, and, oh, and I should mention that I'm Greg May. I'm the transportation policy director at a thousand friends of Wisconsin. Um, so, you know, as I just mentioned, it's part of a monthly webinar series. Our next webinar is on March 16th. Um, and it's going to involve the Wisconsin uh, Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, WICCI. Uh, and they'll be joining us. Uh, WCC, WICCI is a collaboration of statewide scientists um, in partnership with UW-Madison's Nelson Institute for Environmental Studies um, and the Wisconsin DNR. And they're going to be discussing their new assessment reports. It's been uh, 11 years since their last report uh, in 2011. And this report looks at but the impacts of climate change across Wisconsin, uh, its impact on residents, um, and describes the kind of scientific progress towards their solutions. Um, so this is, you know, we really hope you'll be able to join us. It's this incredibly in-depth report looking at, you know, how rainfall and changing temperatures will be impacting all, all parts of Wisconsin and forestry and wildlife um, and our streams and our lakes. It's going to be a really excellent presentation. So we hope that you guys can uh, join us for that. We'll be including a link in the chat to join that. Uh, just for a little bit of information for those who don't know who we are, we are 1,000 Friends of Wisconsin. We were founded in 1996 to help pass Wisconsin's comprehensive planning law. Um, after that success, we continued to promote land use and transportation policies that promote healthy, sustainable, and more equitable communities in Wisconsin. We also run Active Wisconsin, which is a coalition of communities and advocacy groups from around the state dedicated to active transportation infrastructure. Uh, just a little bit of an update on what we've been up to lately. Um, we've participated in Transit Equity Day this month. Uh, Transit Equity Day promotes Rosa Parks' birthday on February 4th, uh, and it links her active resistance and the right for all to affordable, reliable public transit. Um, we had a ton of partners in, in the Coalition for More Responsible Transportation, a coalition we're a part of advocating for more sustainable transportation policy. Um, and those, those partners did some amazing work around Wisconsin. Um, it was an incredibly successful year. We got Governor Evers uh, to make a proclamation, as well as mayors from Madison, Eau Claire, La Crosse, Appleton, Nina, Menasha, and Wausau. Uh, it was really an awesome event. Um, and, and you can go ahead to our website to learn a little bit more about that. Um, Wisconsin, our 1,000 Friends also serves on the Wisconsin Department of Transportation Stakeholder Task Force, which is a large group of transportation interests, including freight, rail, airports, towns, counties, and transit. Uh, there, we specifically advocated for more climate change planning uh, at the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, especially in their Connect 2050 plan, um, which is their ongoing long-range transportation plan. Um, we also serve on WISDOT's Non-Driver Advisory Council, uh, which just recently released a map of where non-drivers are located across Wisconsin. Uh, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation notes that 31% of Wisconsin is considered non-drivers, and this includes our aging population, students, low-income individuals, people with disabilities, uh, and those who prefer not to drive. Um, so advocating to get this map and that information out there has been awesome, and it's great to see a map of both the urban and rural areas that show where the nearly 1.8 million Wisconsinites who do not drive are located. Um, and so now on to the main show. Uh, we're honored to be joined today by Beth Osborne, who's the Executive Director at Transportation for America. Previously, Beth worked at the United States Department of Transportation during the Obama administration, and she's a leading advocate, advocate for more equitable and sustainable transportation systems. And she was at the forefront of the infrastructure bill and efforts to support better funding mechanisms, prioritizing maintenance above expansion and more funding for public transit. 
Um, I heard a lot about this uh, and her advocacy on the infrastructure bill on the podcast, The War on Cars, where she's featured in episode 67. I would highly recommend checking that out if you're interested. Um, she is the executive director at Transportation for America, which is a national advocacy organization uh, working on transportation. And they make excellent reports, like Driving Down Emissions, which is a report we'll be hearing about today, um, which looks at the connection between land use and transportation. Uh, they also, a recent, another excellent recent report is Congestion Con, which explores how our expansion first approach has cost us a fortune and not solved the problem it set out to fix. And of course, they have a lot of wonderful ongoing reporting on the federal infrastructure bills. So um, if you have not done so already, I would recommend following them on social media uh, and checking out their website for a ton of useful information. So I once again want to thank you for joining us uh, and we're honored to be having Beth here today with us and I'll let her take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and appreciate everybody's interest in uh, this issue. Um, I am going to take a moment now and try not to speak and share my screen at the same time as I discover I am not that good at multitasking. Um, hold on one quick second. It's a, a skill I've learned to develop over the years. <laughs> Yeah, I can't say I'm very good at it. Challenging. Um, there it is. Okay. So um, we're going to talk. I'm just going to move this so I can share the whole screen. There we go. Um, I'm going to really talk uh, from uh, our report, Driving Down Emissions, which looks at the intersection between transportation, land use, and climate change. But I am going to branch out in, in some other directions as well. I think fundamentally there's a handful of things we need to consider when we're trying to convince people to focus on the changes needed to address climate inequity. One, people do not understand how the built environment impacts these issues. And that means the transportation system and the, uh, the land use system as well. So the first place we need to go is explaining it in ways that people understand. Two, people do not intuit the impacts or, or what the built environment even is and how they interact with it and how it impacts their experience. So a lot of what we have to do there is make it real to them, either through explaining uh, different areas they're familiar with or finding ways to make temporary changes because change is hard for anyone. Um, it's actually one of the greatest survival instincts of the human species is that we are nervous about things we don't fully understand. And, you know, long time back that, that meant big danger, but we still feel that way. So we need to find ways for people to get their arms around the, the changes we're talking about. Um, and three, People have deeply held preconceptions about transportation and the way their communities are developed that are dead wrong, but they're deeply held and deeply understood. So we have to really talk about performance, connect it back to their community and their experience, and connect it back to the policies. So um, I was just introduced, so I'm not going to introduce myself again. Uh, here's some facts that I know you all know, but it still surprises a lot of people uh, that the transportation sector is the largest uh, emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it's also the, uh, sec the sector that has been growing. So while the electric uh, utility industry uh, and other manufacturing have been getting more efficient, transportation has become less efficient. So uh, a lot of what I talk about is just finding ways to stop the bleeding there. Uh, we don't have to talk about transformation right off the bat. We have to talk about how we stop making things worse. The other thing is uh, I do not want to suggest that any action is a bad idea. All actions to improve uh, uh, the efficiency of our transportation system is welcome and needed and we should do it. But I do find in a lot of conversations, people go to things that, again, that they can get their arm around, like electrifying transit. And I want to point out the portion of, uh, of the emissions that are coming 
from transit. And this is not just transit, it's other as well. Um, so a, a lot of times we think, well, that's something I can control. It's a government run, let's go to that. But we can't do that to the exclusion of the big parts. And a lot of the efforts that, that come up uh, really exclude the areas where we really need to focus to the to uh, only focus on the things that they feel like they can get their arms around. So this is an important thing to uh, to uh, bring situational awareness to those that want to get involved. Another thing that's really important is it's a lot of people are so focused on what they believe will get us uh, to zero emission vehicles that they forget all the damage that can be done along the way. For one thing, we won't be zero emission. I'll get into that. Uh, by electrifying 100% of our fleet because the transportation industry produces emissions from other parts. But also, um, you know, I, I should actually draw a graph. What we want is a graph that goes like this and maybe even steeper, right? But if we, if we continue to build a system where even short trips are dangerous or impossible outside of a vehicle, we could see something that's more like this. And the problem is, it's about the amount of carbon that goes into the atmosphere, not the fact that one day we reach zero or close to zero. There are no climate gods to go negotiate with and say, yeah, yeah, we were, we were really inefficient about making improvements in the early days, but we got there. So can't you just overlook our mistakes? No, we should not be inefficient. We should not let one part of the industry go untouched and, and unaddressed while another part is uh, spiraling out of control or, or while well, another part is working really hard. So I, I bring this up because we actually saw a big increase in the efficiency of vehicles between uh, 1990 and 2017, but people drove more. And so even with an 18% efficiency improvement, emissions went up. So uh, we have to really consider how much we're undermining our goals by allowing uh, uh, vehicle miles traveled to go up and really by prohibiting people from getting around any other way. Um, this is not gonna surprise anybody, but as we see driving go up and down, we see pollution go up and down. Um, but another thing I wanna point out is the climate is not the only part uh, or uh, tailpipe emissions are not the only part of the issue that we need to focus on. It's the one that gets all the attention. It's the one that's the easiest to spot, but you know, we can cover the landscape with pavement for EVs as well as we do for uh, traditional gas engines. And that very pavement creates urban heat island effects that are quite dangerous and tend to disproportionately harm black and brown communities. Uh, and so it's not enough that we just address uh, the climate impacts of uh, the tailpipe, we have to think about the climate impacts of the whole system built to accommodate the vehicle. We also should be talking about other environmental effects. Um, you know, while greenhouse gas emissions get everybody's attention these days, uh, there are other emissions that have direct health impacts uh, on people, particularly uh, particulate matter, which can continue to uh, emit just from the pavement, tires, and brakes. And so we have to think about uh, health impacts of a transportation system that is still auto only uh, and uh, water impacts and loss of natural land that could uh, have plants that uh, uh, soak up some of those carbon emissions. I mean, there are many parts of this program that create havoc for the climate, the environment and uh, public health that uh, are not addressed by going in with a surgical instrument to only address uh, you know, the climate impacts. And we have to think about that too. Um, now, I know this is stuff that, that you all naturally understand, um, but uh, when, one of the deeply held beliefs is if we expand highways, we'll get rid of congestion. So when folks come in and talk about um, you know, equity for folks that don't or can't drive, or um, uh, emissions, public health impacts and environmental impacts and uh, climate impacts of transportation, in their mind, we're saying you will suffer more congestion in order to address these things. But one of the things that they don't realize is the very things we're doing to alleviate congestion are inducing more congestion. 
So what the, the choice they're really being given is to suffer more congestion while polluting more that creates havoc for the climate, the environment, and public health. That it's an and situation. You're getting both negative results. It's not one versus another. And therefore, it makes the concept of induced demand something we have to really help people understand. Um, I, at the very end, am going to try to show you all a quick video on this because I just think it's greatly entertaining and a funny way to share it with people. But this graphic is something that we created. Just point out that when you add lanes, people change their driving behavior. They might add trips at times a day that they wouldn't have driven before because of traffic congestion. They might shift uh, to single occupancy driving. They might shift corridors. Um, and then it encourages development on the fringes that adds trips. And next thing you know, you have worse congestion than you had before the project. So really helping people understand how poorly we have performed in, in congestion alleviation so that they see that they're being asked to tolerate the expenditure of their dollars for more congestion and more pollution and more climate harm and more public health impacts that starts to break down uh, the false choice that they've been handed. Um, another important thing is the economic harm of the way we design our communities. I know a lot of you are familiar with the housing plus transportation index created by um, uh, CNT out of Chicago. But uh, one statistic that I think is really important is between 1993 and 2017, uh, vehicle miles driven by, per day uh, grew per person by 20%. So a lot of what we're doing is saying you will spend, your travel budget will increase. And that's not just your budget in terms of your money. It's the, the time from your day, something very finite that you have to dedicate to accomplish the same things has grown. You know, people only have a certain amount of the time of their day to dedicate to travel. And if everything they need is further and further away, they have to dedicate more and more of their time to that travel. And that's one of the reasons we have so much traffic congestion is we have set up a system where everything you need is so far away. Um, we're looking for ways to explain why that is, why the fact of the matter might be as the crow flies, the things you need might not be so far from your home. But in our, our uh, and this is not just a matter of uh, land use patterns, it's also our roadway connectivity or lack thereof, where you might have a home that as the crow flies is just barely across the street <laughs> uh, from the school. But because of the lack of connectivity in a roadway network, you have to walk all the way out to what is likely a, a, a practically a highway to accommodate all the traffic being thrown onto that road to go to the next windy road to go to that school, making it too long to walk or bike and too dangerous because this kind of roadway network um, is incredibly effective at generating the most possible congestion with the fewest po possible people. Uh, this is one of the great successes of the American transportation program. We have found ways to generate congestion, big congestion with very few people, something that very few other places have been able to accomplish, except for those following in our feet, uh, our footsteps. Um, and if you look even in the, the engineer manuals, it will show you that, that this kind of a uh, system where everything, all the roads feed into one main highway or one main arterial moves far fewer cars than a gridded traditional system, even if that traffic moves slower. So to show that adding uh, capacity doesn't work, I think it's really important that we not argue about the theoretical. We have a conversation about where we are and how our current approach has performed. That is a much more powerful argument. So again, between uh, 1993 and 2017, uh, freeway capacity grew faster than population and yet congestion exploded. And we looked at the largest hundred metropolitan areas. All of them saw a very large increase in congestion. 
Um, I believe the lowest increase in congestion was 40%. And that was for an area that had lost population and added freeway capacity. So clearly it's not about adding freeway capacity. If you can't accommodate fewer people without more congestion, something is going terribly wrong. And you know, here are some examples of it. And you can see there's a variety here. There in San Diego, they didn't quite keep up uh, with the population growth, but they, they came close, 175% increase. Nashville built slightly more uh, in terms of uh, their freeway growth than uh, their population growth, 329% more congestion. Pensacola, Florida did absolutely everything they could here. I mean, they really built a lot uh, of uh, added capacity, 233% increase in uh, in delay. Um, and, and here's a, one of the examples of an area that lost population, lost population and saw 175% increase in delay. Again, we can't possibly be doing things right. It can't possibly have to do with freeway capacity if you lose people and have not just a little more congestion, 175% more congestion. And it's these numbers that make people just start to question at least, well, what else is going on here? Um, so it's uh, important to then bring people to land use. You know, the notion of, you know, having all the things you need spread out from you as a, a way to keep everybody on the road alone longer. Of course, you're going to sit in more congestion. Um, I remember talking to uh, uh, a congressman from the, the Dallas area who said when he when he's in D.C. for work, he's about six blocks from the grocery and he almost always uh, walks. Um, but when he's at home, he lives two blocks from the grocery and he only drives because, you know, he would have to uh climb over a gate to get into the parking lot. He'd have to cross a frightening major roadway. He'd then have to walk across that parking lot, something, all, all things you're not gonna do with bags or at all. Um, so really showing people the results of, you know, throwing people onto that one road, but then making them go up and down the corridor to find all the different things rather than putting it together. We found in our congestion con, uh, uh, report that a lot of places saw uh, a pretty significant increase uh, in uh, congestion just from people driving farther, not because of increases in population uh, or delay. Um, their travel times increased because everything they needed was further away. And so they get even more anxious about traffic congestion because everything is so inconvenient. And the only policy in this country we've ever considered to fix this inconvenience that we ourselves have generated is making the travel theoretically faster by having more roadway capacity. It's as if it's just never occurred to anyone to just bring the things they need a little bit closer to where they live. Um, so uh, this is another example of the roadway system um, and the things you need being spread out. Um, it's going to be very important and, and we can show the failures of the system, but to be a part of the solutions, we're going to have to talk about ways to measure the system differently. Um, I'm also, I want to talk about one other area of performance, which is uh, our dangerous by design report. Uh, part of my team is also the National Complete Streets uh, Coalition. And uh, we have shown just a marked increase in uh, pedestrian deaths on our roadways over the last really 15 years, but the last 10 years have been particularly troubling. And there's been a theory for decades that um, fatalities go up as people drive more and they come down as people drive less. Well, in 2020, people drove significantly less and we had the largest increase in uh, the rate of traffic deaths that we had seen in over 90 years. And uh, what we're finding is that's because without traffic congestion, people drive the speed that the roadway accommodates. People will always drive the most comfortable speed that the roadway design allows. Um, and because we've built our roadways so 
wide and big to again, theoretically allow for fast transport between inconveniently placed places or locations. Um, uh, when there's no traffic to slow people down, people drive at the speed that a big, wide, multi-lane highway style road would tell them to. And that is really dangerous. Uh, and it's dangerous for a whole lot of reasons. A big reason is you just can't see as much the faster you're going. Your range of vision decreases. And then you have less time uh, to react to a potential conflict. And if you crash, there's a much greater chance of, uh, of killing somebody, uh, particularly somebody outside of a vehicle. Though I will say that the traffic fatalities uh, that have, we've seen uh, between 2020 and 2021 are affecting people inside of the car as, uh, the car as much as people outside of the car. In 2021, we did see uh, some uh, driving come back, but we didn't see it coming back uh, the way it existed before. We saw a greater number of off-peak trips. So we were spreading out the traffic throughout the day and then allowing, again, higher speeds overall because we weren't seeing a crush at particular times that created the traffic congestion that really slowed uh, uh, travel down and slowed speeds down. Um, and of course, as in all things, uh, the people who are disproportionately affected are uh, uh, Black and Native Americans, uh, 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 Hispanics to a lesser degree, but certainly more than white people. And that is because, of course, uh, uh, we do find those populations have less access to a reliable automobile and are more likely to be pedestrians, but also because we build our most dangerous roads through their communities, and those communities tend to have less access to the political power needed to change that. So um, some of the things that we can do that to, to change this, again, I cannot stress enough how much work we have to do to educate people on the performance of the system and what's not working. They do not know these things. We have had a transportation program in this country now for it, all of my career and before, where even failures in the program are excuses to put more money into it. People just intuit that this is all that all projects are a good thing. The longer the idea has been out there, the more necessary it is to speed it. There's never this notion of hmm, maybe if we came up with that idea 40 years ago, it might not be quite uh, you know what we need to do right now. So we we need to spend years just teaching people about the, sit, the situation we find ourselves in. And while we're doing it, we need to talk about getting onerous regulations out of the way of providing more homes where people naturally are going to be able to drive less. That's gonna have great both climate and equity impacts. Um, I did not grow up very poor. I grew up solidly middle-class, but I can tell you that uh, because I lived in an area uh, where the housing was more affordable uh, and, you know, it was a first ring suburb, so it's significantly more walkable than what you find in a lot of communities today. But um, we had to have four cars for the five members of my family. And that, that uh, means less savings for my parents. It means less ability to help kids with school uh, and getting started in life. I carried some pretty hefty school debt because my parents spent all of my college money on all those cars. And we really need to think about what the impact of a, an auto only system is, not just on the climate, but what it does to the finances of people trying to move up uh, economically and, and reach for opportunity. We're going to need to make safety the top priority for street design and to encourage shorter trips, but we're also going to have to make clear that if we make speed of a vehicle a priority, we have decided safety is not a priority. Where there are cross streets and where there are um, uh, driveways and people, uh, you can't have speed and safety. You just can't. Once there's development, everything should slow down if safety matters at all. If you want to keep high speeds, and there are times to have high speed roads, like this is why we built the interstates. And it's also why we built the interstates as separated highways. You don't allow cross streets. You don't allow pedestrians. You don't allow um, uh, uh, driveways to enter. And in fact, we have highly managed points of entrance and exit because we knew in the 1950s that speed and conflict were incompatible. And that's another thing we're going to have to deal with. Another 
trope we're going to have to deal with is the idea that because your potential speed is high means you might get someplace faster. It's actually completely untrue. And sometimes if you just slow down all the speeds and avoid the, the speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, and the potential for conflicts that lead to crashes, you actually reduce people's travel time. So we have to get into that. We need to require people to measure induced demand. Pure and simple. It needs to be in every uh, document so that uh, DOTs can't claim a massive benefit that is never going to come to be. We need to institute greenhouse gas reduction and less driving as goals of the transportation system for both cost reasons and environmental reasons. Um, and if your state, your state has full ability to be measuring this stuff right now in their um, in their projects and their programs, they could be setting targets. Uh, they don't have to be told to do it. So, you know, if you have a governor who claims to care about this and they're not measuring it and, and setting targets and publicizing it, that would be a question uh, that I would want to uh, ask. Um, and then, uh, and I, I will also point out Colorado has just established a, a really cool uh, regulation that will require their DOT to measure expected greenhouse gas emissions from all of their new capacity projects. And if they see it go up, have to implement mitigations to bring greenhouse gases down uh, particularly with non-driving investments. We should invest heavily in other options for getting around. And the last thing I would say, uh, I put it last, but I think that this is actually rather profound and the University of Wisconsin is really leading uh, the effort along with the University of Minnesota on this, which is to measure whether or not people ever get where they need to go. Right now, we determine whether or not the transportation system is working by how fast vehicles move. If they drive in circles forever, uh, as long as they're driving at speed, that's an A-plus system. But if they drive for five minutes in stop and go traffic, that is an utter failure that requires tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to fix. And that is a big problem that we need to address. We have the capacity to measure whole trips uh, using the technology that is in your smartphone. If we all have that capacity through Google Maps, there's really no excuse for uh, multi-billion dollar uh, agencies to not use very similar things. Um, and for those that uh, want help measuring induced demand, uh, we collaborated with the Rocky Mountain Institute to create a calculator that all of you can use. Strongly encourage you to check it out. Uh, it, it's uh, a national calculator based on a product uh, created by the University of uh, California at Davis for Caltrans being used uh, by Caltrans now. Um, and it just requires you to know how many lane miles are going to be added in what county. And it will uh, tell you what the induced demand impacts will be as well as the greenhouse gas emissions increase. Um, so at this point, I think I'm going to just go ahead and close up. Um, I, I will try to, you know, as we, uh, I might take a break while we're doing some questions and stuff to show you that video that I found super entertaining, um, but I'm happy to answer some questions in the interim. Great. Thank you so much for this, uh, just all this wonderful information, Beth. You're such a resource on all of these things. Um, and we're really excited that just, I was just kind of scanning through the audience of people here. We have a lot of, we have a couple of elected officials from various cities around Wisconsin, some grass tops, uh, some leaders on, some real big leaders on climate change. Um, so really awesome to see a lot of like really wonderful climate advocates here. Um, and so people can feel free to uh, post questions in the chat if you uh, you know have any questions that, that Beth can help with. Um, and I know Susan had a specific question if she'd like to jump off first while we let people give people a moment to ask some questions. Sure. Yeah, um, I was really struck by especially your point about prioritizing safety. And I was wondering if you could provide some comments. Um, maybe some people here know or don't know that a couple of weeks ago, the US Department of Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg, released, um, what was it, the National Roadway Safety Standards. So this is federal policy that's meant to um, improve roadway safety. Um, and I've seen some positive reaction to that and some criticism to that. And I was wondering, Beth, if you wouldn't mind um, giving us your insights. Yeah, so I, what's important to point out is it's really a plan. Nothing will change due to that plan. They put out a plan to do things. 
Um, I'm from the South. We call it fixing to do stuff. When you're fixing to do stuff, you're not really doing anything yet. Um, but they have committed to do a whole bunch of really interesting things, including addressing speed on roadways. For the first time, they talked about inappropriate speeds and, and dangerous speeds being something other than speeding. So speeding is when you're going above the speed limit, but dangerous speeds can be below the speed limit because we have such a reactive process of setting speed limits. If enough people start speeding, we just change the speed limit and, and increase it. All of our roadway designs are actually designed to react to human error and mistakes. We fully understand the design can impact uh, mistakes, but it only reacts to it when it causes speeds to go up. So if people speed, we'll raise the speed limit. If we see people going faster, we'll widen the lanes, we'll create more uh, uh, clear zones, we'll get rid of uh, trees, we'll get rid of uh, uh, utility poles, we'll get rid of pedestrians because uh, we recognize that as, as the speeds go up, people may make mistakes and they lose control of their vehicle and they go wandering off into places they shouldn't be. That stops when you need it to go the other way. If you try to slow down traffic, you'll see the DOTs go, oh, we, you know, we, we're not responsible for behavior. We can't do anything. What this plan said was that's not true. We really need to analyze what are the appropriate speeds, how we set speed limits, how we design for safe speeds. And that was one of the most exciting things that I have seen. But now I wanna see that plan become action because my career, I think like many of yours, is littered with plans that are just covered in dust. So I'm watching to see the actual actions and behaviors they take. I'll also tell you that uh, I remember when I was in the Obama administration, I spent um, you know, a lot of times working on things that took years to come out. Um, you should never depend on getting a second term and you want your changes to happen with enough time for people to realize that it's not the scariest thing on earth, that maybe it's okay, that maybe they can work with it before there's any potential change in administration. So a lot of times I hear folks in this administration saying, we know we should assume we only have three years. Mm -mm. They should assume they have 12 to 18 months. They need change to be in place and socialize before there's any chance of turnover. So that's the next step that I'm waiting to learn from in terms of what they do on safety. But that profile of speed, that was really, that was something I've never seen before. A um, couple of follow-ups to that, and I guess you can take these in whichever order feels best to you. Um, a, someone in the chat posted some frustration with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. That is a common feeling around here. Um, she has said that cities seem to be, a lot of cities seem to be getting on board with this idea of, you know, better design, safer design, but um, the state agencies that control a lot of the funding don't necessarily get on board. So ideas for convincing them. And then we have another question from Jeremy asking, is it impactful to do across the board speed limit reduction in a city like going all 30 miles per hour down to 25, all 25 down to 20 for residential streets. Yes, uh, so I'll start with the first one. Um, look, no agency voluntarily changes what they do. And no, no human does that. I mean, we're all this way. As much as I wanna just be critical of DOTs, every last one of us has to get uncomfortable with how things are going before they're willing to teach themselves something brand new and change everything. Uh, I mean, I we can all identify things that we've faced like that in our personal lives. So the notion that the DOT is just going to up and change because some, you know, retrain all their staff and hire new types of people and, and go through all of their documents and update them and try brand new things, um, especially with a fleet of lawyers telling them change is scary, change is scary. That's silly. They're not going to. So the way you get them to is you publicize the heck out of their failures. Um, and that's why I'm focusing on, all right, you expanded your roads, you blew it, you made it worse. Uh, so, you know, you you expanded the roadway by 100% and, you know, for a 40% population increase and our, our congestion is, is now, you know, 800% larger. Uh, sounds like I'm throwing money down a rabbit hole. Why should I give you another dime? 
check their work. You know, I, I know that there's been a couple highways that US PERG has looked at in Wisconsin, but we don't check our work in transportation. Uh, it's just one of the deeply held secrets. Uh, DOTs will make projections for what, uh, you know, what the need for the roadway, what the traffic will be in the future. They never have to go back and see if they were right and let people know that they were wrong. So what we do is we project, we build, we forget. We project, we build, we forget. If you actually go back and look, you'll discover we're, we come up with very precise targets for what's going to happen. They're just incredibly wrong. I mean, they'll have four or five numbers past the decimal point. It's just wildly wrong. Um, and so we need to go check and ask why they blew it. Um, because people only start fixing their work if they're graded. Um, and uh, I would say, you know, on that front, that's one of the reasons we developed the shift calculator to say, well, you're saying that traffic's gonna be X, but I've got information based on all known, uh, you know, literature and studying of the transportation field that says it's actually Y. Um, and, and make them answer for it. Make them start explaining their models. I mean, Wisconsin DOT is famous for a lawsuit where they stood before a judge and could not explain their models. So let, let's make them explain uh, their models. Um, the last thing I would say is there's this huge bipartisan uh, support for more funding for the same program. You know, we're going to fix the mistakes of the program by putting more money into the exact same program. When we don't do that, the notion is, okay, like we get it that safety is a problem. We will spend 1% of our budget to improve safety and 99% on the status quo. That'll dig us out of the hole, right? I mean, come on. Um, so I think that we, a lot of times that uh, folks that are skeptical still sign on to these funding increases because we feel like we won't be invited to the table and we won't be taken seriously if we don't support it. Um, How's that going? At some point, we got to learn. Being at the big kids' table doesn't fix anything. So don't support it. Hold people accountable for supporting more money to programs that don't work. That's a great way to convince uh, a, a DOT that they might want to do something different because if they don't, they won't get more money. So those are some of the things I would recommend on that front. Um, uh, in terms of the question about uh, how do we apply these principles to well-developed older communities, one of the greatest examples in the country uh, is uh, Arlington, Virginia. My colleague, uh, Chris Zimmerman, was uh, a, a county councilman there for 16 years. And it's interesting, I didn't meet him until uh, towards the end of his tenure and after, but I live in DC and, and I was in the area throughout that whole time. And when I first moved here, Arlington was the snooziest, most boring place in the region. And no young person who wanted to enjoy life at all was going to Arlington. And now if I left the district, I would absolutely move to Arlington. It is a beautiful place. It, it has great town centers and just a couple blocks away, beautiful leafy communities. So if you want that single family house with the yard, you can still be walking distance from a really exciting place. I mean, they've just, it's an extraordinary retrofit. Um, and there's some really great uh, uh, lessons to learn from what they did uh, and how they took advantage of the fact that communities are changing all around you, whether you notice or, or not. And that's another thing we have to socialize for people is that um, their community is not static. Uh, if your community is static, it's actually falling apart. If it's successful at all, it is changing. And the only question is are you going to harness that change or are you gonna let it happen to you? Arling deci Arlington decided to harness it. And it's a very, it's got a strong economy. It's got a high quality of life. It's got, you know, just so many great things going for it. Great affordable housing, um, all of which was really not the case when I first moved to the region. Um, but the notion that because it's built, it can't be adjusted is just not the case. So uh, that's, I, I really study them. There's some other good examples too that I'm happy to share. Um, the question on across the board speed limit reduction is a great question. Um, Washington DC did it, but didn't change the design of any of their roadways. So they've changed zero behavior. Um, they are, however, increasing the number of tickets they give people, which I think is a big, uh, a big way to, to sow doubt 
in your the purpose behind your approach. It sounds like a money grab. It sounds like a speed trap, not like an actual safety effort. Um, so I, I think DC could have put it together in a much better way. They are now starting to create really interesting temporary treatments around schools to start where uh, they extend uh, corners with uh, just delineators and, and temporary interventions. They've used public art. Uh, they've brought artists in to draw uh, it within that space so that there's a color pop in the eye of the, uh, the driver to see that that's something to notice. And then when the kids from the school are standing in that space, they're more noticeable. They can get more visibility before they cross. There's a lot of cool things like that. But I would argue that as you're looking at lowering speeds, it has to come part and parcel with the physical change that tells the, uh, the, the human that there's something different there, that they need to change their behavior. Um, I know that there are a lot of safety advocates that want every driver to put the amount of decision making into driving that they put into, you know, like if you were a race car driver. Um, but if you if you use that very high level of thought for every minute of driving, you'd be exhausted once you were done. A 30 minute trip would be the end of your day. So we have to recognize that people aren't going to, to approach this like a, a chemistry experiment where it's gonna take full attention and create an environment that makes behavior and slower speeds natural. And so, I love the idea of lowering speeds, but it has to come with a capital improvement and some temporary improvement uh, uh, to the design to actually make that happen. And you certainly can't dial up enforcement before you've brought that in. Um, so that's uh, yes and yes if you, dot, dot, dot. Um, and then uh, uh, Chris sends me a, a question of um, why a DOT would want to change and uh, primes me with the example of Virginia. Um, so again, I, I, I moved to DC in the late 90s um, and Virginia DOT and, and the governor, then Mark Warner, now Senator, tried to get an increase in gas taxes uh, through, through a ballot initiative and they got shellacked. I mean, they were destroyed. Uh, conservatives and liberals alike came out and voted them down because overall their approach was, or people's belief was, we don't like what we're getting. We don't trust uh, Virginia DOT. We don't like their products. So no, I'm not giving you more money. I'd, I'd take away what you had if I could. Um, they were deeply unpopular. So uh, a, a governor that came after him, uh, Governor McAuliffe, uh, worked with uh, his state legislature to pass a bill that required them to consider their spending according to five priority areas, uh, safety improvements, economic uh, development, uh, access to jobs with a particular focus on uh, lower income people's access to jobs, um, safety improvements, environmental impact, and for areas of 200,000 or over, coordination with land use, which has since been made into an access to non-work destinations measure. Um, and what they could do then, one thing is Virginia stopped proposing new projects. It had to come from the locals. They found that that improved their collaboration uh, with locals by an extraordinary amount. Uh, but the big thing is, they could explain to people why they invested, where they invested and what they would get. And then they could measure whether or not they got it. That kind of openness and sunlight has created a lot of faith in what Virginia DOT does. They are not immensely unpopular anymore and they have gotten increases in funding as a result. So it goes back to how do you change uh, a DOT? Get their attention, cut off their money, stop supporting them, check their work, publicize their failure. I wish we could just promote uh, best practices and encourage good behavior, but it doesn't tend to cause the systematic change that you really need. Um, people have to run into uh, a wall or a roadblock before they consider a different path. And that's what Virginia experienced. And it really did transform them. They're now seven years into this process of um, 
uh, scoring every new capacity project based on those priorities. And uh, they create a big book and they deliver it to every member of their legislature. So they see exactly where their project lies on their list by score. And then they work with folks who don't get the score they want to improve the score and get them funded by improving the project and get them funded in future years. Great. Um, we, I know you have a very hard one o'clock, so I don't know how much, how long the video you'd like to share is. We have about just like a couple minutes, so wrap up. But we could take one more question and get to the video if it's short. Uh, or it's a minute and a half, so it's pretty short. Oh, great. Okay. Well, yeah. So then you could. Uh, thanks for answering all these wonderful questions, and thanks for all the wonderful questions, everyone. Uh, maybe as a last question, we can take here from Kermit, who's asking. Um, does your set of recommended or recommended strategies include traffic calming features like speed bumps, or is that an ineffective band-aid? And, and not to hijack that, but are, are there, uh, you know, strategies that you think that are more effective versus some that maybe just are band-aids that you'd recommend in the traffic calming world? Yeah, I don't love uh, speed bumps in particular um, because, again, I I don't blame the driver. This notion that that American drivers are inherently uh, reckless, cruel, and out for blood, which seems to pervade even a New York Times article I said saw yesterday talking about the, the difficulty and pain that people are facing through COVID and somehow translating that into making them maniacs on the street. I, I, that kind of blame, it, the driver is a victim too. The driver is being told two different things that cannot be squared. Um, they're being told, hey, here's a nice wide turn. This curb allows you to keep going at high speed as you turn, but you better be able to stop on a dime if you see someone in the, uh, in the crosswalk. Well, you can't go fast and stop on a dime. And it's unfair. We will then blame the driver if they hit someone when we set them up. It's the same thing with a speed bump. Here's a big wide road, go fast. Oh, here's a speed bump. I hope you noticed it, you, you know, destroy, destroy your car. There are temporary traffic calming things we can do. Um, I'm not saying we have to spend millions of dollars to overhaul the street uh, right off the bat. We should seek that, but there are things you can do temporarily. Like I said, you can extend curbs with, with just the delineators. Y yes, they're cheap. Yes, I mean, I think, I think they cost like 80 bucks. They're, they're really cheap. <laughs> and yes, somebody will hit them and they'll have to be replaced, big deal. Um, it still, it teaches, it, it changes the feeling of the environment. It gives people, again, a temporary uh, uh, change in the structure that they can then understand and, and communicate with their DOT on more permanent uh, and more uh, uh, steady changes. Um, we've actually worked with many communities. We just finished up with uh, three communities, smaller communities in uh, Washington state where they came in and used paint, bollards, delineators, street furniture to transform uh, the design of a strip of roadway and then just monitor it and see how that changed behavior. Um, it was a great way to bring people into the conversation rather than the normal way we do where we hand people a, an engineering sketch and say, now close your eyes and go into a VR where you, uh, you know, in your beautiful virtual reality in your brain, you move around in this new environment and tell us what you think. No, not even the engineer does that. So we need to recognize that these kind of temporary interventions can help, but the changes you're looking for to calm traffic, you want people to feel hugged. The more constrained they feel, you don't have to tell people not to go 40 miles per hour through an alley. Why? Because they know they'll run into the walls. You, they can feel constrained. That will fix things. You can do that with parking. You can do that with bollards. You can do it with delineators. You can do it with medians. Make them feel constrained. Uh, don't allow people to take uh, turns at speed. That's a crazy idea, especially if there's a crosswalk there. Bring that, you know, square that uh, 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 curb and bring it out so that people who are moving around uh, are more visible. It makes the driver have to slow down and look before they turn. These are just very natural things. And again, do some of it temporarily. Bring planters out for your median to start before you do something permanent. But yeah, it was really about making that driver feel hemmed in. They will naturally drive slower, no matter what. It's why in every other developed country, they don't tend to crash as much and kill people as much. Narrow the roadway. Um, so uh, let me real quick share my screen.
and show you just, I find this is just a really fun and an entertaining way to explain uh, to people um, what induced a band is. And I find that people, uh, they, I don't know, they just get a kick out of this. Okay, let's see. By ingesting the 12 months worth of data you send, that's about two terabytes worth. Wow. What you're looking at now is a typical midweek traffic flow. Green is good, orange indicates slower than average, red is heavy. Now we can manually input a range of external factors, wet weather, public holidays, RDOs for the industrial sector, Break down on a major arterial. That's pretty impressive. So we've taken your project. The road upgrade, extra lanes on an off-ramp lengthening. We've factored in all those improvements. So starting with current flow during peak, then during construction, some problems. Of course. And then when it opens. Oh, that's brilliant. Amazing. And with the machine learning, we can keep it going. Year two, year three, year four. Wait, wait, what's going on? What happened? Where'd the green go? What happened? Why did the traffic get worse? Have you heard of the Jevons paradox? I'm hoping they're a death metal band. It basically states that the better you make something like a road, the more people will use it. Isn't that a good thing? No, it means you spend a lot of money now for a very short-term benefit. So there is some benefit? Oh, sure. Average travel times crossing the city will be cut by two and a half minutes. Or a little less. Call it two. Really? And that lasts for 14, 15 months. Then declines. Uh, no, stays flat. Then declines. Well, for $300 billion, I guess we were hoping for something a little more dramatic. Two and a half minutes. Call it two. You don't look happy. Somehow, humor seems to win the day. And I've gotten further with folks by showing them that than almost any other graphic. Uh, big thank you to uh, Australian situation comedy writers for making planning and traffic offices really funny. Well, thank you so much, Beth, and that's fantastic. And, and just another reminder to check out Transportation for America uh, and Beth Osborne on, on Twitter and on social media for some of these, uh, you know, really wonderful uh, graphics and information, always learning such. Um, so thank you again, Beth, for joining us. Um, just a real quick reminder that Transportation for America has one, all these wonderful reports and resources online. Again, follow them on social media. I would like to thank everybody for coming. Um, again, we have another upcoming webinar in March, uh, really looking at an in-depth analysis on how Wisconsin's climate will be changing because of climate change and, and the impacts on that. Uh, it's a really in-depth report. We're really excited for it. Um, and to check out uh, a thousand friends, uh, we have. If you have any questions, here are our emails. We're also on social media. Um, so I know uh, Beth has a hard one. Uh, PM stop. So we're going to get off now. But thank you everyone for joining and for all the wonderful questions. Um, and for the, uh, you know, all the elected officials on here who are making suggestions about speed limits and things, we're really excited to have this great conversation. So have a wonderful day and thank you everyone for coming.